Okay, so I'm Connor Svensson, founder and CEO of Web3 Labs. Um, I've been very, very, I guess, involved via Web3J with the Ethereum community for a number of years. And I'm here to first of all tell, hopefully educate some people here about Web3J, um, but also just uh, talk more about the broader ecosystem and you know, what we've been up to recently. Uh, first question though, are there actually any Web3J users or JVM developers in here? Um, given, got some at least anyway. Good, good. Uh, so it's ni nice to um, have you here because it's certainly, this space is dominated a lot by the JavaScript community, but uh, certainly from the server side JVM perspective, there's still a lot of users there, but I think it, it doesn't get quite as much attention just for, you know, for obvious reasons. So Web3J, I first released it back in 2016. Um, it's the leading JVM platform uh, integration library for Ethereum. It has you know, a, a fair number of users. Typically, it's sort of server-side developers or people who aren't trying to um, you know, deploy your sort of interactive type dApps. Uh, it's the, on average, down, it gets over 65,000 downloads a month and has had over one and a half million downloads over its lifetime. This is sort of a conservative estimation, not the sort of you know, total number of package downloads, which would inflate the number somewhat. Lots of people use it. Um, we've got big enterprise all the way through to startups. But what's more interesting is to talk about the ecosystem. It started off being a library just to simplify the whole connectivity uh, from JVM and Android applications to Ethereum nodes. So what started off as you know, having a facade sort of around the JSON RPC API, it kind of evolved into something that could generate wallets, then uh, generate smart contract wrappers, do all the cryptographic signing, so you could deploy and manage contracts and so on and so forth. But one of the, the, the ongoing themes with the library has always been for people who work with this specific platform, how can we make the whole developer experience as simple as possible? And so over time, this has kind of grown to encompass other things such as Gradle and Maven, which are the two main build tools used uh, on the JVM platform. They have Web3J support now. We also have an embedded EVM there. So you have Hyperledger Basu. Uh, the, we, we have a wrap around the EVM there along with the testing framework. So what this means is you can write unit tests that actually execute within your uh, you, the, the JVM runtime on your machine when you're developing code, so you're not having to go off and talk to nodes. You don't need to run any additional node infrastructure as well, which is quite a key point here, because one of the, you know, the last thing we want is people to have to spin up a node in order to actually do the uh, development. Another part, too, is the embedded Solidity compiler as well. So we have a, a, a build component now that what it will do, it will look at the pragma in your Solidity files, and then based on that, it will actually download the versions of the Solidity compiler, the most recent one that's compatible with the pragmas listed in the source code, uh, and it will actually run those within your build process. So what this means from the perspective of, of a developer is that they don't actually need to install Solidity on their machine they just need to have the, the, the Java, well, sorry, the JVM-based build tools for Web3J, and that will automatically take care of the installation of Solidity, the, the build, uh, and so on and so forth. And so it, it's all about this kind of integrated approach. And there's a CLI there as well to easily scaffold projects from scratch. So this project with IntelliJ, it's been something that's been on our minds for a while, kind of like the, the missing piece of the puzzle, so to speak, because we spent all of this time developing this sort of integrated experience to, again, you know, make everything as simple as possible for developers. It is a complex space uh, for, for anyone when they're getting up to speed with uh, you know, blockchain developments. Not only is there you know, the actual learning of solidity, there's also the understanding of the cryptographic side of things, distributed systems, as well as the development itself. So the more we can do there in order to simplify that, the better in, 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 in our mind. And the reason we focused on IntelliJ here was simply because it's by far the most widely used IDE by developers on the JVM platform. And you know, we're thinking in terms of, well, if someone's got an application that they're working on, um, in using all of the other build tooling, isn't it great if they can actually then seamlessly make use of the debugger there? And that's where this IntelliJ debugger came from. So I'm going to pass over to Andrew, who's been working on this, as I said. He's going to give a brief demo. This is alpha. It's the first time we've shared what we've done so far publicly. 
it's not complete yet, but we're certainly we're really happy with the progress that we've made. So uh, I'll pass over to you, Andre. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Andrew. Uh, I'm a software engineer uh, in a Web3 lab. Um, uh, I'm happy to be here and uh, to share some works uh, of uh, one of our projects. So let's go. Uh, I prepared, uh, we prepared uh, some simple contract uh, with some uh, arithmetic uh, and uh, function uh, to just uh, show uh, some uh, all functionality of what we implemented. Let's go. Uh, so in IDEA, uh, we can just uh, have a plugin uh, which we can uh, just run uh, as a usual uh, debug plugin in IDEA. Uh, we can just uh, add uh, uh, some breakpoints uh, inside a Solidity contract uh, using a common uh, IDEA uh, and uh, run a plugin. Uh, we can see some opcodes and uh, uh, we can see that uh, we stop on a breakpoint. Uh, and uh, uh, we see uh, some uh, memory stack. Uh, we can see uh, class variables, uh, a greeting template, for example, uh, in a human readable way. Uh, also, we can see uh, constructor variables, and uh, uh, let's go on the next breakpoint. And uh, uh, here uh, we can see a result of uh, some uh, operations and a new variable in a memory stack. Uh, so let's take a look uh, how it's working. Uh, another functionality uh, of a debugger step debugger step functionality. Uh, so we can see uh, step over functionality. Uh, step into. and uh, step out. Uh, also, we can test uh, step over without uh, going inside the function. Uh, so as you see, uh, functionality is working uh, almost the same as a, a common Java code uh, in, a, uh, in a basic uh, idea debugger. Uh, it was like uh, the first our aim uh, in current project and step. So that's it from my side. Thanks, Andrei. So I know, I know on the surface it's fairly rudimentary, the whole thing of stepping through the code there and uh, you know, with this sort of stuff you take it for granted when you're actually debugging this stuff, but it's taken us a while to be able to get to this point. Uh, but to just articulate kind of how long, you know, how far we've come with this, um, this, we have the debugger window integration there, we have breakpoints on contract deployment there, we have the stepping functionality and the simple stack decoding. Um, one, one of the points too that, um, of, of course, is, is kind of a challenge um, more generally with uh, Solidity insofar as, you know, I think when you, when you have code where you deploy a contract, you really want it to be able to just stick an arbitrary breakpoint in the contract and then when it gets, gets deployed and when that gets hit, that it will get picked up on. Um, we, we're not quite there in terms of having it on any method, but we can have it on um, constructors. But there are challenges because, you know, when you deploy a contract, you've got constructor parameters and so on, and you need to ensure that when you're going from the JVM bytecode to the EVM bytecode, that there's a way of translating the two there so getting these hooks right and so on is you know it's non-trivial engineering work to do it 
We also want to ensure that the decoding of the stack is um, more intelligent. What, what we saw there was, you, you, in effect, um, you had the sort of string-based uh, decoding there, but because of the variety of different types that you can have there, we want to you know, support as many of them as possible. Uh, and then, as well, we need to get this released on the uh, IntelliJ marketplace and, and also support for importing contracts as well. Uh, one of the things I should have called out earlier, too, so we talk about IntelliJ, but really what this means is any, any of the JetBrains products uh, suites. So you've got PyCharm for Python developers. You've got, um, they've got like a Rust ID. They've got a Golang ID. They've got a Node um, ID. So the intent anyway is that you'll be able to you know, make use of uh, this functionality within those different ones. Of course, we're thinking at it more from the JVM perspective, but at the same time, there's no reason why the plugin couldn't support these, these, these other uh, runtimes too. So just to wrap up, uh, we want to give thanks to the Ethereum Foundation. They've supported us um, in terms of Web3J anyway, certainly over the years. The Web3J community as well, there's been uh, over 150 people have actually contributed to the project in some shape or form. And the Web3 Labs team as well, because most of the people in the company at some point have worked on Web3J. Yeah, as with open source, it is a labor of love. It's not something that there's straightforward monetization angles for and so on. But at the same time, we want to ensure that uh, the community in the JVM space is well supported because ultimately, the better supported all these different developer ecosystems are, the better it is for Ethereum. If you want to learn more about the project, we've now opened up the GitHub page there. Um, you can learn more about Web3 Labs at web3labs.com, and um, our Twitter profiles are up there too. Did anyone have any questions they wanted to ask me, or you know, essentially Andre, as he can answer the, the hard technical ones? Is there an extra debugging data you'd like to see from the compiler that would make implementation easier? And like stepping to the code or things like this? Uh, right now we are using uh, a binary code, uh, IBI, uh, to uh, like interpret it uh, and uh, to work with the uh, opcode. Uh, but uh, in the future uh, steps, uh, I think, uh, yes, we will be use. Like anything specific you'd like that would help you? Uh, sorry? Like any specific uh, information that we could output that would help? Like examples? Um, uh, yeah, we have like an uh, open uh, repository. Uh, you can uh, ask some questions uh, or suggestions. Was there any specific information that would be more helpful for Solidity to output? Yeah, because from you were saying you're allow, relying on just EVM bytecode, right? And like, uh, we're providing some debugging features, but the, like frequent problem is that we don't really know what frameworks and other tools would, could use like to make uh, this easier. And we could provide this information, but we often like don't know what people need. So any information that would be helpful to us. Uh, yeah, I think uh, we should discuss about it. A bit after. Okay, thanks. Thank you. So when you hit the debug button and it deploys a contract and then you execute it to, to stop at the right point, what tools or libraries are you using underneath to, to do the deployment? Uh, in the NIS, uh, we use uh, LM uh, native. Uh, so from, so from Hyperledger Basu. Yeah. It's the Hyperledger Basu EVM. So we've just got um, jar files, which is the standard uh, code archive format for the JVM, and um, those kind of come with the plugin. And so that's, that's the execution environment. Okay, thanks. 